on getting our town certified with Sustainable Jersey um, to be a, a town of really environmental responsibility and environmental sustainability. So we're trying to raise our status, if you will, of being an environmentally sound town. And we're actually doing that along with the state of New Jersey in this program called Sustainable Jersey. And it's basically a checkoff list of a lot of different things, energy and um, energy efficiency and recycling and um, water conservation and um, things that you would look at for um, a, a whole town to be energy efficient, uh, environmentally efficient. And so uh, Matthew Cavanaugh is the head of the committee and with Judy Hernandez, they, uh, uh, they run it and it's a, it's a whole group of residents and including CIWA, <laughs> there's probably you know, a couple hundred people who are involved in this at different levels doing different things, including people who work for the township as well. And uh, Mike, uh, Mayor Soriano is uh, the oversight, oversees the whole project. So it's an actual, it's a whole project that's been going on. And then the Environmental Advisory Committee, which I am the chair of, is a nine person, uh, again, volunteer residents who work with the township's environmental committee, as well as the planning board to uh, come up with uh, um, issues that are, are, that are environmentally related. And then we also work as an advisory committee to the town council. So if, they're gonna make a decision on a project or a development, they can contact our committee if they have questions about things like energy or water or zoning or things like that. So that's where we're coming from, right? Jean, next slide. So this is basically what I was just talking about. Um, the Precipity Green Team's mission is to collaborate residents, government and business to uh, implement programs that improve our quality of life and physical environment and, and financial sustainability. Because if you save energy, you save money. So we're trying to get that point across as well. And then the environmental team. Okay, next slide. I don't have sharing capacity on my uh, Zoom at the moment. So Jean's gonna be helping me. So please excuse my next slide at the end of every slide, but I have to uh, do it that way for now. Um, okay, so we're gonna start out. I'm gonna do, um, I, full disclosure, I'm a retired science teacher. <laughs> so I'm gonna do this program, at whatever, you know, how I'm comfortable with it. And that's in a capacity of, of teaching and um, part of my science uh, program. I always like to look at the history of how did things get started and how did we get here and where did we come from? And that's basically what this program is tonight. And then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what our town's doing in terms of plastic um, awareness and recycling and things like that. So uh, we'll start at the very beginning. You know, you've heard of the Iron Age and the Bronze Age. You know, we, we go back to where uh, humans started using tools and making products. This is what, you know, this is where we all began with um, using materials in our society. So copper, iron, silver, gold, titanium, steel, bronze, aluminum, hardwoods, and stones are some of the products that we've used over in the beginning of uh, time. But as you notice, two things about them. Number one, they're, they're all, they all come from the earth. They're all natural, which means that when we're done with them, it's a lot easier to put them back into the environment. And then last, and the second thing about them is that, um, uh, that they don't bend. And that's a, it sounds simple, it sounds very simplistic, but it's the reason that plastics are so popular in our society. So if you look at the picture, that's how the atoms of uh, metals and um, hardwoods are lined up and they're, they're very tight, they're very secure. And if you think about it, you know, they don't have that flexibility. They don't have that ability to, to be flexible. Um, aluminum, if we, if we make it into thin sheets, we can sort of play around with a little bit but not like plastic. Plastic is a whole different animal. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight, okay? Next slide, Jane. So <clears throat> what happens with plastic is that it is called a polymer. And uh, a polymer is simply a chain of molecules. 
And these are hydrocarbons made of hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And they make this chain, but on these chains at, the, at each point that the chain connects is called a rotating bond. So even if you put your two fists together and you, you can turn them. <clears throat> and this is the difference between plastic and all other materials. So that flexibility is really, you know, what we're what we were going after in, in product making and molding and designing things and stuff like that. <clears throat> and as you'll see, as we as we go through this history, um, plastic was like it was a, a, a universal miracle when it first came out. It, it, you know, you can't believe that we have this material. So it started out as a as a good a good thing in our society. Um, and I put this paper chain, uh, this paper loops up when I teach, uh, sometimes I go into elementary school and I do this program on uh, plastics recycling. And I always have the kids make a paper chain, paper chain link and show them how to have that rotating bonds and flexibility. Very simple. Next slide. So of course we have um, rubber from plants and you know you always picture like a, a neanderthal walking through the woods and grabbing this plant and stretching it out and at, at you know the very first time someone would say wow look at this this is something that you know it's not hard like metal it's not hot you know it doesn't it doesn't hurt like wood it's nice it's flexible so that's really where the, the concept of it came right and it, natural um, tortoise shells and um, horns like from antlers and rhinoceros and things like that, they're all polymers. And they have a certain, they're, they're called keratin, but they also have a certain flexibility to them. So, I mean, if you've ever seen a tortoise shell piece, um, it, it's bendable. And people, again, back in ancient history, started to carve it and use it and come up with ideas for it and things like that. So what you're looking at are the original plastics your rubber plant and your tortoise shells. Next slide. <clears throat> now we get up into the, um, uh, the 20th century and we uh, also have now great advances in chemistry. And the, one of the first big products that comes out, is that, are we in the right one? I yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Yeah, Wait, let me go back a minute, hold on. I'm gonna. Yep. So uh, one of the big one of the big products that comes out is uh, Charles Goodwin invents um, the process of vulcanization. Oh, I know what happened. Uh, I'm going from the rubber plant to this. So with vulcanization, if you add sulfur to the rubber plant, you then get this flexible and malleable material. And if you think of a tire on a car, that's plastic. But now we have plastic that's really moldable. We can really mold it. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see why I got confused. It'll confuse you too. <laughs> it's the, uh, we're going back now to the 1800s. So uh, in 1856 and 18 to 1870, we had um, plastic started to become more, like I said, of a chemistry experiment. People started to look at it as a product that we could start using. Because up until then, if you go back and look at it, I mean, you look at stickly furniture, we have that craftsman in our, um, in, in our town. And if you go back in history and look at furniture and buildings, you know, the, the stone buildings, castles, all we always use stone, metal, and wood. Stone, metal, and wood, that was it. So there wasn't, you know, plastic didn't exist in our society. So around the uh, late 1800s, um, a couple of things happened. Parks and Hyatt, Parks was actually from England. Um, they started to play with plastics a little bit more and using chemistry and, and adding products and, and heating and cooling. They invented celluloid, uh, which is not only for film, it's famous in film because of the song, Celluloid Heroes, but it's also celluloid is used for a lot of products. You can see I have pool balls up there, but a lot of plastic products that are older plastics. Celluloid was the type of plastic. Then um, Hyatt, same person, invented the plastic injection molding machine. And what this does is uh, there's also a process called thermoplastic. So now we realize we can heat plastic up and we can liquefy it. It becomes liquidy. And then we can put it in a machine and we can put it in a mold. And then when it cools, it's hard again. 
I told you, this is a miracle. This was like, you know, this was like the most amazing thing that people had ever seen in their lives. And so now we have a material, because you can't put wood in a machine and shape it. You can't put metal in a machine and shape it like this, but have that flexibility and the light, the lightness of it and the weight. There's just, you know, and the durability of it. So we invented a machine where we can make plastic products. Okay, next slide. Now, up until now, we're still using natural plastics and ad adding things to it, like the sulfurs and different kinds of materials that will, will change its flexibility. But um, in 1909, a product called Bakelite was invented. And uh, you may have heard that as a company name, but that was the first synthetic plastic. And if you remember, I said these are a, ch a chain of polymers, so a chain of molecules. So at this point, as far as science has been advancing, this was not hard to do. So now in a laboratory, we can now start linking these molecules together and start making synthetic plastics. And the product that synthetic plastics are made of is um, crude oil, fossil fuels. So oil is used now to make plastic. So we take, you take oil and you, you know, heat it and add, add different elements to it. And you can now make this, uh, this stretchable, malleable material. And we're making it now from oil. So that's synthetic plastic. Um, and if you see that telephone, it, it doesn't look like a big deal, but back in those days, you know, when you can make a product like this and give it to someone, it, you know, it, it was a brand new thing. Plastics were new. Um, and then in 1926, and, and it, it's interesting to look at the dates because it wasn't that long ago when all of this sort of started taking off. Um, Goodrich, you know the name Goodrich, you know the name Goodyear, you know, you know these names. They made PVC piping. And this was made in 1926. But as you know, we still build houses with lead pipes and then, and then copper pipes in the 60s and 70s. So we didn't start using PVC as piping till much, much later. But the PVC itself was invented as a product. Next slide, Jean. And <clears throat> Uh, the polyethylene then came into the picture. And these are all just different types of plastics. There were hundreds of different types of plastics. We use the word plastic as one, one big word, but there's all these little variations of it, how hard it is, how flexible it is, um, how thin you can, can get it. So there's different, different types of plastics. Um, polyethylene comes in and this is really where plastic started taking off in the consumer's home. We could make plastic wrap. We could make um, uh, garbage cans are made out of plastic. If you think about it, you know, when you're done with this presentation, if you want a little exercise, remember I'm a teacher, I'll give you homework, I don't care. <laughs> so I've got a little exercise, go through your house or just take one room and look at everything in that room that's made out of plastic. First of all, you probably never have done this. Who does, right? Crazy teachers, you know, we do it. You are going to be amazed at how much plastic that you have in, in things like, and I'm just, I'm sitting at a desk. I have, I have my scissors are made out of plastic. My scissors handle, my dog's ear medicine bottle is made out of plastic. My fidget. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> That's made out of plastic. I mean, I could pick, my pen is made out of plastic. My mouse is made out of plastic. I'm just picking up stuff that is in front of me and it's all made out of plastic. So it, there's a lot to that, yeah. So, um, so like I said, we figured out that this material was amazing and here's why. It's resistant to fading, resistant to chipping. It retains properties in hot and cold weather and impervious to acids, which is important because of acid rain which actually ruins a lot of mater materials. Um, the Taj Mahal is being ru ruined because acid rain is eating through, it's made out of marble. So here's a material that we can make something out of and it will last forever. So you see, it's getting better and better and people were getting excited and they were starting to invest in plastic companies and plastic um, products. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, there's the leg, I couldn't resist. <laughs> the topic is nylons. <laughs> so we get into 1939 
And uh, we see now another name, DuPont. We have Goodrich, we have Goodyear, DuPont. Um, you're gonna see Dow Chemical later. These companies started out and became rich and famous because of plastics. So uh, DuPont made nylon. Now nylon, you hear nylons and you think of stockings on women, but also nylon is, now they took these polymers, you know, these little long, uh, the paper, paper link, the paper loop links, and they made them really small. And now they can make thread, plastic thread. Ny nylon is plastic thread. So instead of wearing pants that are made out of cotton threads that can rip and tear and get faded. And every time you wash them, they get worn down a little bit. Now you can make clothes out of polyester with nylon in it and they last forever. Um, unless you go by a fire. Uh, so that's another story for another day, but <laughs> polyester will melt. <laughs> but now you have uh, fabrics, clothing, carpeting, uh, by the way, most of the carpet in your house is plastic, most likely. Um, fishing nets, which actually are a huge product in the world, world fishing industry. Um, nylon stockings, bathing suits, all the clothes you could think of. So nylon then became this new um, type of product. Again, another branch off of plastic. Now we have nylon. Now we have PZ, PVC piping. Now we have rubber tires. Now we have all these different products that we can start to... Um, uh, sell to the consumer. And that's, you know, that's, a, that's supply and demand. And it's what people will be enamored with and go out and spend money on. That's what they wanted to, you know, it was a, you know, they want to make money. Now, keep in mind, this is 1939. Do you think they were thinking about, oh man, plastic doesn't break down. What is, what's going to happen to the future of our children? Do you think that that was even in their radar? The answer is no. There's no indication back then that plastic was any kind of a problem. It was a wonderful solution. So you can't go back and blame these people and say, oh, they, you know, they, they should have known better and we, should, we shouldn't be where we are today. They didn't know. And I, I believe that. I've, you know, I've never seen any evidence that DuPont or Goodrich or Goodyear had any inkling that we were gonna have, you know, oceans of plastic. That's really, that's really another, another, another story of how we got oceans of plastic. This is the manufacturing and the consumer part of it that where did plastic come from? Okay, our next slide. Okay, so they, you know, they're inventing uh, all different kinds of products and oh, and you get, go in your car, sit in your car and see what's made out of plastic, your consoles and your steering wheel and your, uh, the head of your stick shift and um, everything's made out of plastic just about. It's hard to find things that aren't made out of plastic these days. But uh, so we invent the plastic bottle. And again, if you look at the date, 1941, we got a plastic bottle now. This is great because you know what happens to glass bottles? They break. Now we have plastic bottles. They're lightweight and you can carry them with you. Um, and so again, we have another, another new product. We don't, again, it's plastic is the general umbrella, but now we have polyethylene terephthylate. Don't worry, not everybody can pronounce everything. <laughs> polyethylene terephthylate. And we call this PET, P-E-T plastics. Um, and this was a huge breakthrough. Here's why. You can, you could, this plastic, we could make really thin and it stays clear, but its molecules were so tight together that you could hold liquid in it and carbonation and hot and cold products. And so it could be used for so many different things and again, people were just like enamored with the possibilities. This was like a huge, great thing. We could make a plastic bottle. So um, this lightweight bottle started to, uh, oh, and thermoplastics was also a word I wanted to, to put out there as far as the education part of this. Um, thermo means heat. So the thermoplastic is a material that you can heat up to liquefy, mold it, and then when it cools down, it solidifies. 
So we can make these plastic bottles. Um, also at this time, actually a little earlier than this, um, Henry Ford uh, started the concept of um, the assembly line. And so that was really one, I think to me, one of the most important inventions or concepts of, of all our consumerism, that you could take a product and then mass produce it by just creating a machine or a, an assembly line concept where you put all the pieces together. So now we're mass producing. It's only 1941. We're, we're inventing plastic, different types of plastics. We're mass producing. We have the, the plastic injection machine. And, and everybody, who doesn't love plastic? The housewives that are home with heavy bottles and, 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 and things that are breaking around the house, it becomes this amazing industry. And a lot of people got very wealthy as a result, of course. Okay, next slide. Then we had World War II. So keep in mind that World War I was much earlier, so the plastics didn't make such a big uh, impact. But um, World War II came along and the uh, military definitely started using plastics more. Um, I just put on here gearing wheels, which is if you add uh, rubber rims, if you thicken the rubber rims around it, you can uh, go over better terrain. Uh, you can go faster. Um, parachute cords. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, tell you that picture of that guy in that Jeep is my father from World War II, and his job was a paratrooper. And he would jump out of planes with a rifle on his back over France. And his parachutes were made out of nylon. I've seen one of them. He had one at home, and the, even the, the parachute itself was nylon. You've seen parachutes or felt parachute material. Plastic. Um, the cockpits, you know, the different pieces of the, the war equipment, um, radar, different machinery. And again, we be get back to the uh, rubber tires for all that, you know, tank treads, things like that. So that was, so, so then, you know, again, people are loving plastic. <laughs> this was just, this was a plastic world. All right, next uh, slide, please. I'm having a little fun here. So, uh, now we invent the, uh, the polyethylene bag and 1950, it was not that long ago. I was born in the fifties. Don't make fun of it. <laughs> it's not that long ago. We invented the bag, the plastic bag. Now, I wrote on here, it's light, it's strong. What could go wrong? And about this time, 50s to the 60s to the 70s, um, you know, we're getting to this mass production, this consumerism. Next slide, Jean. <clears throat> uh, and so the, um, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1963 went to uh, Giulio Natti from Italy. And he's really came up with another a type of way of, um, so you have these polymers, and I was telling you in the beginning, they're very flexible and movable and all that stuff. And this chemist came up with a way of strengthening those bonds a little bit. And so now we can start producing, you know, larger boats and larger products. And you see those flexi chairs there, probably everyone has one on their back porch. Uh, so there, so a whole variety of products came out of his, his uh, strengthening of these polymer bonds. Next slide. Okay, now we, ha we haven't gotten a styrofoam. Plastic, it's plastic. And, and if you, again, if you just look around the house, look around our town, look around our society, we have, we have gone bananas over this stuff. Um, so we have uh, 1963 and th there's Dow Chemical. They're again, a very big company. Uh, they ended up uh, making styrofoam. So you take plastic, and it's a very simple, again, it's a very simple pro process. You take plastic and you start blowing uh, this gas into it to start bubbling it up. And now if you think of styrofoam, when you look at it real closely, if you look at styrofoam with the magnifying glass or under a microscope, you'll see that it's a lot of bubbles. It looks bubbly because they blew it up with this, uh, with this gas. The gas that they use to blow up styrofoam is chlorofluorocarbons. 
And you may have heard of that, um, hopefully maybe in high school, <laughs> they're called CFCs. And when they are released either by accident in the plant or when cups are crushed and they're actually released out of the styrofoam cups, that, those are the molecules that go up into the atmosphere and break apart the ozone layer. Our ozone, our, our oxygen that we breathe is O2. So it's a called well, diatomic molecule. There's two oxygen atoms. Ozone is O3, so it's three oxygen atoms. And that chlorine atom from the CFCs breaks off and can break apart those O3 molecules. So you've heard of you've heard of the hole in the ozone layer. That's part of how, how you know that's part of the problem. But I also put the party starts here because who doesn't like a cold beer in a styrofoam cup? It's a joke. <laughs> I'm just trying to have some fun. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and your, your red solo cups. Don't think I don't know, okay? <laughs> yeah, so the, so the cups, but they're great because they keep the hot, hot. You got hot chocolate on a winter, on a cold winter's day. If you got hot chocolate in a styrofoam cup, you, that steam's coming out, you're drinking hot chocolate. Who doesn't want that, right? Um, so styrofoam came in and, you know, it's, it's just, it's another form of plastic. So all of these nylons, uh, polymers, plastic, um, styrofoam, all of these things are just all forms of plastic. Okay, next slide, please. So, I got a rock there crying because metals are now second fiddle. <laughs> so we hit the 1960s. Plastics are durable. Um, we looked at them as the answer to many of our consumer problems. You know, how can how can this chair be lighter? How can this coffee be hotter? How can you know how can I find parts that are light enough to drive my to be in my car? Um, how can I make products that will last longer in the, in the elements outside? It solved a lot of problems. So, uh, so companies caught on and uh, we produce 30, 300 million tons of plastic every year. We produce, that's new, made, we make it. Remember, this is now synthetic. It's being made in laboratories and being, being formed and, and made into things and being shipped out. And uh, the possibilities for the future are endless, really, when you think about it. We can make houses. We can make houses out of plastic. We can make so many things out of plastic. Now, um, I just want to give you a warning that the next slide is probably going to upset you. But that's what this program is about. So it's a little bit of this, a little bit of you know where it came from, the history of plastics. But I think, as we all know, there's a problem with plastics. And so um, just a, a warning. Next slide, please. So we have animals on our planet that don't give a crap about plastic. They don't know what it is. They don't know, they don't have a need for it. They don't understand it. Um, they, they encounter it in the, in the woods and on the, in the oceans and wherever you see animals, um, you know, you're going to you're interacting with some kind of a human uh, community or residential area, you're going to find plastics in their environment. And it's a problem because not only is it, um, it doesn't go away and, you know, it's in their way. And certainly they don't want to be walking along in the, on their little trails and kick around, you know, an, an old chair or something like that. But if you can see in these pictures, it's killing them. So if they're if they're wrapped in a nylon net, or if they're um, that's a whale that 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 plastic came out of his stomach when he was found dead, um, it's horrible. But anyway, uh, the next slide is just as upsetting. <laughs> upsetting. I don't mean to, I am so sorry that I'm putting this up here, but this is it. Next slide, please. So this is what happens. This is why we're talking about this. This is why the green team and the Parsippany Environmental Advisory Committee is saying. Let's stop and look at this because it's not all, it's not all roses, you know? So, and then again, these are just animals that have, uh, have come across plastic in their world. And um, it's just this, to the top left is a bird feeding a baby bird plastic. So that's, you know, 
that's the that's the downside of it. Next slide, please. Okay, so so we want to start thinking about. And I know there's just you know there's a very small audience here, and I appreciate everybody that's here today. Um, I wish I had an audience of ten thousand people for this, because we have to start spreading the word and start working a little bit more towards. I mean, everybody can do their own part, but um, we got to start moving towards using less plastic, buying less plastic, just being conscious of our decisions and conscious of what we're buying. Um, that's why I said, do that little exercise. You go through a room and see what plastic you have in there. And you're gonna be amazed at what, uh, at what you have. And you're gonna say, I, I don't remember buying all this plastic. And that's exactly what the companies want. They don't want you to even be conscious that you're you know, buying something that's gonna be around for 500 years. So, um, oh, I forgot to put up, I forgot this one picture. There was, I had a picture, I'm gonna tell you about it. This will be a visual. I had a picture of a, a guy who's a colonial soldier, like from Washington's troops. And he's uh, standing there with his musket. And it says, if plastic was around when he was around, it would still be around. That would have been good, I forgot. I forgot that one, but anyway. So where are you gonna be in 500 years? I'll give you a minute to think about that. <laughs> where are you going to be in 500 years because all the plastic in your house is probably going to be here okay but there's a way you can help next slide Jean. um so one a very this is so simple plastic bags that we get at the grocery stores and this is just a start of course but um you go to the grocery store you you know, fill up your cart halfway, you go and check out and you could come out with five, six, maybe 10 plastic bags and you're going to carry them to your car. You're going to unload your groceries and now you've got 10 plastic bags and we're trying to do something about that. It's not necessary. Um, if you can start using cloth bags and remembering your cloth bags, and this is, you have to be con. If you want to be conscious of plastic that you buy and plastic in your house, you can also be conscious of, I'm going to the store, I'm bringing my cloth bags. And um, what happened was that with the COVID, um, when the pandemic hit, we, we do have a law in town. And I think, I don't, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but we have a, um, a bag ban and it is absolutely a law. And it is, um, I lose you there. It's absolutely a law and it's definitely, um, uh, still in place. But when the pandemic hit, uh, the mayor lightened up on it because people were getting nervous about going to stores. They were getting nervous about, um, will their cloth bag from home? Can they bring it from home and bring it to the store and bring it back? And we didn't have the answer. So we went back to plastics, but we now know that they are safe, cloth bags and polyester bags and things that you're bringing in and out and reusing. And we also know that uh, we still have the law in place, so we want to get back to that. And that's part of what this presentation, you know, sort of hopefully will will remind people. Next slide, please. I may I, I may have to go and get my charger. I'll see how that goes. I, of course, <laughs> I run into that problem. Um, so here's our plastic bag ban. It's an ordinance. It was passed um, uh, in June of 2019. Um, Councilwoman Janice McCarthy was instrumental in uh, putting together this, uh, uh, this ordinance, as well as uh, former Mayor Mimi Letts, who's uh, no longer with us, but she was instrumental in this. Um, the Environmental Committee, Mayor Soriano, um, Judy Hernandez, who's, who's here with us tonight from the Persephone Green Team. Um, we had a lot of people working on this, and uh, it, we're very proud that we passed it. Next year, the whole state's gonna have a bag ban. And it's a law. I mean, I don't know why, why people are fighting it, but you know, it's something that we're trying to teach people why you should not use plastic. That's sort of what tonight's presentation was. But um, we did lighten up on it during the pandemic, but now we're gonna go back to it. And here's the ordinance. All re this is verbatim from the ordinance. All retail establishments are prohibited from, from providing single-use plastic carryout bags and non-recyclable paper bags to customers for the purpose of transporting, 
products or goods out of a business or store. Establishments are prohibited from providing single plastic carry-up bags. Now, if you go to ShopRite tonight and you go and you go and buy something, they're going to give you a single-use plastic carry-out bag. <laughs> For the reason that I just said, we've lightened up on it and we're not, we, we're not going in. You know, we don't have a plastic bag enforcement team. If we did, I'd like to be on it, but we don't have one right now. But um, if you bring your cloth bag and you don't take that plastic bag, you are being part of the solution. That's, the, that's sort of the takeaway from tonight. Um, and everybody's yelling about the 10 cent fee. We left that in the ordinance on purpose because we don't want people to say, well, I forgot my cloth bag, but I'll, I can get a paper bag. Well, you gotta pay for it. And then people got upset about that, but we're trying to get people to remember their cloth bags. You bring your own bags, you don't have a problem. Okay, next slide. Um, there's been a lot of research done and you can look this up yourself on the COVID bags and the cloth bags. This was the issue when we reversed the ordinance at the beginning of this, the pandemic, as horrible as it was, um, we're still, I mean, you know, I feel that we're only halfway there, but we're, we're doing, making a lot of progress. And we do have to start now thinking about getting, when you say getting back to normal, Let's also start getting back to being more environmentally conscious. Let's start getting back to be better citizens of the planet. Let's start getting back to thinking of the future and our children. Let's start getting back to those things also, because we were doing pretty well. We were on our way, you know, for that. Um, and you can clean your bags. I, I think cleaning your bags when you, when you can, and as often as you can, is really the key to this. Okay, next slide, Jean. Um, and I'm wrapping things up now. Uh, act as if you make as if what you do makes a difference, because um, it absolutely does. Because if I go to the store tonight and I don't take that one plastic bag, that's one less plastic bag in the world. And um, what we want to do is not have manufacturers have a place to to make plastic bags for anymore. That would be the main thing, you know, the the, the end goal, the end game. Is where, where why would you make plastic bags if ever if nobody's using them anymore? So we have to start, you know, start thinking big like that. And uh, one more slide. Uh, be a light, not a judge. Be a model, not a critic. I say I, I'm a teacher, so I say that for our children um, and uh, the 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 next generations. Th that's important to remember that. If you go to the next slide, this is why, because the children are watching us. And I think that if, if that, you know, that should be your main, the main reason. Um, and that's it. That wraps up our plastics presentation this evening. And um, what I'd like to do is just ask if anyone has any questions or comments, we open the floor. I am looking at everybody here. Yes, I see. Uh, who do we got here? Uh, I think Lynn has a question. And okay, Lynn, go ahead. Oh, hi. I usually think of um, like water bottles as the worst, but I guess uh, plastic bags are just as bad or worse. Yeah, I mean, just in quantity. And the thing about plastics is that all plastic just it just doesn't go anywhere. That that was the beauty of it, and that was why I wanted to do the history of it. That was the beauty of it. It doesn't break down. It doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't break apart. It'll last forever. That's what they were selling us on. And now we're like, oh crap, it's gonna last forever. <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right, Lynn. The water bottles are, are such a problem. And I grew up in the seventies and we, you know, kids went to a water fountain or a hose. We didn't have water bottles. So it just happened in that quick of a time and um, it is as big of a problem. You're absolutely right. Hey, Laura, this is Bruce. So in Parsippany, my understanding is that uh, for recyclables, they don't do a three or a six. Can you explain the reasoning why? And wouldn't it be easier for the public to just recycle everything? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, one of the problems is, is that the, uh, as I was trying to explain tonight, there are different types of plastic. Okay. So um, the type of plastic, in fact, I have it right here. The, uh, the three and the six, which are the PVC and the styrofoam. 
There's not a company right now that's taking them and recycling them. Okay. And then it also includes um, some of like the food containers and things like that. Um, there's our, recyc our recyclables go to a plant in Mine Hill. And they are the ones who determine, you know, what they can and can't use. So to, to send out to different companies that will take back certain plastics. And the three and the six cannot be recycled. You know, maybe the state should look at not only if they're going to ban plastic bags, ban three and six. That's yeah, no, I, well, I agree. Well, styrofoam, yeah, styrofoam is- They are banning, problem. they're banning styrofoam, I think. New Jersey. Yeah, that's in the state. Yeah. That's in the state law. Yeah, it's going to be. It is going to be styrofoam. Yeah. Oh wow. Mm -hmm. I think New so, Jersey is going to wind up having one of the strongest, you know, toughest laws. You now know. things like the plastic film, um, like uh, uh, bread bags and and saran wrap. You know, the plas thin plastic film. We don't. Uh, that's something that we also don't take in our recycling. But if you go to Whole Foods right now, uh, they will take that, that thin plastic. So there's different places that you can go to bring the plastics that you do want to recycle or if you have them. There are places you can go, but towns don't, our town doesn't pick everything up. You know, one, one other question I had, if I could ask is- Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's confusing to me why we combine paper and plastics together. It, 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 that doesn't make sense to me. We used to separate it, but now we put it all together. Well, it, get, it gets separated at the uh, recycling plant. Oh, so they, they do it there. Absolutely. And the reason we went to commingling was just to make it easier for residents. Oh, so okay. we found that if you're having people bundle their newspapers and then putting plastics in one bin and maybe glass in another, which some places do, it became a lot of work and people were less reluctant to take the time to do that. They just, you know, you put everything in the garbage. So with commingling, it became, it's so convenient for everyone. It's just for the residents to be able to put everything in a bin. The town takes it up to that Mine Hill plant and they, they separate it there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, oh, you're welcome. No, that was a great question. So here's one for you, Laura. What, yep. are, what is your um, assessment or your thought on using hemp as a, uh, a replacement for things that we make out of plastic. Um, oh yeah, somebody just sent me a great, um, a little uh, th plug on that tonight, that uh, hemp plastic, not only is it um, uh, doable, like we have, the, we have the processes now to take hemp, um, because hemp's, hemp's made out of um, a cellulose, okay? So the hemp is a plant. And the cellulose is a very strong fiber within that plant. Remember we talked about the, the, um, the nylon threads? So the cellulose are these threads and we have the process now to make hemp bottles, which would be, you know what? They'd be a little different than plastic. We're all used to plastic. You know, plastic does have its, its qualities obviously that are good. But if, but we were, if we were to change to a different material, it breaks down, I forget. It's like it's like five years or four right, years. Right. It'll but break down. I wish I'm gonna see if I can find it. Um, it'll break it, it breaks down so much quicker in a um, even in a landfill, hemp bottles break down. But would it also be that we would be getting away from the use of fossil fuels versus yes. a hundred percent, yeah, because plastic made of oil and hemp would be made from hemp plants. Got it would be made from plants that we would grow. And we could do, we could make everything that we make plastic wise, you know, uh, you know, plant pots and computer parts and car parts and all of that, hemp could replace that. Is that? I yes? don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. It would be wonderful if it could, <clears throat> but um, you have to remember that um, if you get into like computer parts and stuff, there has to be a certain um, property that with electronics, you know, that deals with um, uh, uh, 
the ability to work with electronics and things. So okay, okay, I'm just curious. Yeah, I just think you know what it's... though I see all this in our future. You know, if Me if too. somebody can come up with these ideas and and we have to have two things happen. We have to have scientists and and companies come up with these ideas, and then we have to sell them to the consumer, and we have to become a society. I'm I'm going to say like Amsterdam or like you you know some of the European places where they they now live in. You go to France, you won't see a plastic bag in France ever. They never had it. No. They always have their little you know their little baguettes and their little cloth bags on their little and they ride bicycles. Yeah. Um, in Amsterdam, you get bicycles are lined up all over the place. Um, Denmark just, also. Denmark yeah, it's is just, very... it's an automatic, it's an automatic mindset. Yeah. And that's what I think that we need to see happen in the future. Um, I don't know if it's because we're Americans or if because we're too ingrained in our, in our, 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 um, way of thinking, our way of life, but, um, yeah, yeah but something's got to give. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, even Mexico is, is, had a, is a plastic bag ban for a year, a couple of years now. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. every uh, so many countries are there, and I think I mean, even now we're getting used to it, right? We're getting used to not always taking a bag, and so hopefully in a few years. Yeah, I mean, we'll I there. do, and I, you know, I, I, I try to, you know, I, I keep my bags in my car, and when I go into the supermarket, I actually have a a, a big like fold out one that has three sections, and I put it in the bottom of my basket. I fill it up, put it in my car. It's actually easier. Yeah. 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 I actually have two that have little ties that you can connect to your purse or your keys. So I just always have my bags, mm -hmm. you know, connected on my purse or my keys. But, you yeah. know, it's just something that I do. But I think that <laughs> um, this was a very good program. Laura, thank you very much, <laughs> Teacher Laura. Um, thank you everybody for coming yeah um i didn't know if sue, i didn't know if sue had any questions um she's very quiet over there but sue if you'd like to unmute and ask if you have any questions or comments uh, no no questions but the program was fantastic and Good. it's a shame everyone in this country can't hear it you know oh, thank you so much sue that means a lot to me thank you, thank you. yeah and thank you lynn i appreciate it Oh, and also, um, I met my husband was talking, and I missed the part about the Saran wrap and all that. Oh, yeah. I was saying that there's a um, there's a bin up at Whole Foods that takes your like your bread wrappers and Saran wraps and oh. all, any of your thin um your thin plastics like that, any of your plastic bags and stuff. They'll they'll but, take them at Whole yeah. Foods. Yeah, and you know, like um a, a, a plastic bottle of um glass cleaner like Windex. Yeah. I always take the top off and I put that in the garbage and then I recycle the bottom. Do I have to do that? Yeah, right now you do because the plastic on the cap, if you, you know, you feel it, it's so much thicker. Right. That's a different yeah. type of plastic. Yeah. And if you look at the um, uh, the bottle and you, you know, it's thinner and, and has more flexibility, that's another kind of plastic. And that's what a lot of people we use the name plastic so easily. Right. But there are there are so yeah. many different varieties of it. And then the water bottles, I take the tops off and I yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you're do doing the right, yeah. recycle the, right the tops. Way. I don't yeah, yeah. recycle well, the tops. Top. Yeah. You know what? We should get the DPW to do another presentation like we had at the library in person, which would be good because you know, they'll piggyback on to what Laura was doing. Maybe it, they won't be as entertaining as Laura, but, um, <laughs> but it was, but, um, but, you know, it'll tell us exactly what the numbers are. And if you go, if you have an iPhone, you can download an app called recycle app or recycle coach. Yeah. I have, I, and I have it, recycle and you coach, can yeah. find it's recycle coach. And if you, and, it, and it'll link you to Parsippany and it'll tell you what you can and cannot do and when the days are in your area, so. Okay, great. Yeah, great. that's like, like those are the, that's the kind of information that we have to get out to more people. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I call myself the optimistic environmentalist because I <laughs> believe is. that, I believe we will get there. I believe that people will move very slowly towards 
we're not going to go backwards and we're certainly and nobody wants to do harm to the earth i you know i never met a person mm -hmm. who wanted to do harm yeah but i met a right. lot of people who just don't know any better yep. or never got mm -hmm. the education that they needed in environmental science to understand why so what's the what's the big deal about a plastic bag right but as soon as right. we get that information out they're like oh i didn't know that cloth bags are in so yep. And right. we'll get there because we're not we're not fighting against the tide or anything. No, no. We just need to get the information out. And yeah. I have the four right. of you who've come to this program who can now say, hey, I learned this information and tell it all your <laughs> yeah. friends and family. And the best part, of course, is that they if they'd like to see this program again, it'll be on the Parsippany YouTube channel. So you can go and review it again. So that's very good or also. share it with friends or you know send it out absolutely there. absolutely you put, it, put it on your facebook page <laughs> there you go there you go yeah. that's exactly what we can do yeah thank well thank so you much, so much Laura. everybody for coming appreciate it yeah thank you everyone thank you yeah. we'll bye. talk to you later you. Yeah. all right enjoy your all week right. everyone take care bye thank you thanks to bye. you thanks judy bye-bye